All right, well, let's get into it. I got a few minutes. Okay. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Good morning. Today we are in a sermon series titled To Be or Not to Be. To Be or Not to Be. In this series, our church's aim is to acknowledge the fact that being a part of this family, being a part of this community, being a part of Grace Fellowship Church is not merely a spectator sport. This is participative. This is something that we do together. This is something that we do arm in arm. We're committed, devoted to one another. Already in this series, we've talked about uh, we're not just to be served, we're also called to be servants, right? We've also talked about how we're not just supposed to be hearers of the gospel, we're called to be sharers of the gospel. And today, we're going to be talking about financial giving. Yep, that's right, Pastor Rick said, tag your in. <laughs> it's a little awkward for me. To stand up here and tell you, you know, you need to be sacrificial with your giving when the organization that you're giving to it pays my salary. It's a little weird for me. Uh, and there's probably all sorts of thoughts when you hear about a pastor talking about giving at his church. All sorts of different types of people that might come to your mind. We have a, a compilation of some that you might be thinking of. and hug my neck and kiss me and say thank you, thank you, thank you for getting that money out of my pocket. There ought not be any poor among you. That the reason why Jesus hadn't come is because people are not giving away God to them to give. If people would call this number and put this victory all over the world, every available voice, every available outlet, God, the Father, he would say, Jesus, go get them. That if you use your faith as you sow, as you sow the thousand on a credit card, God's going to wipe out your credit card indebtedness. You that don't think I should have that plan? God told me to have that plan. When you give your offering, you're giving it to God. And when you do, you're putting it up in a heavenly bank account. So that when you have a need on the earth, you can make a withdrawal. And your need will be met. One of my chandeliers cost more than most people's house. I got 22 chandeliers in the house. Is so that thousand dollars yes. seed in faith, that believing that this is part of your seed into the kingdom of God. If I want to believe God for a 65 million dollar plan. You cannot stop me. You cannot stop me from dreaming. Put some money. Put some anointing on this money. You put some money. Here. You put Wow. Well, let me just uh, reassure you now. Those pastors are not me and Pastor Rick. Our hearts are not drawn towards money, 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 money you know, up on the stage. These pastors, they're, 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 they're speaking so opposite, so contradictory to the gospel, right? You know? Paul talks about, you know, we, we, we should be giving to those serving in the church. But was he rich by any means? Absolutely not. Jesus is the perfect example. A third of his sermons had to do with money. A third. But how did he live his life? He was homeless his entire ministry. He went bounced from house to house to house, hoping that he might find a place to stay just for the night and then move on. That's the exact opposite of what these pastors are doing, right? They're showing off their wealth. They're exploiting their congregation for a buck or buying multi-million dollar planes. Uh, it's in direct contradiction to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which says we're called to be slaves of Christ, servants of one another, helping those in need, being sacrificial just as Christ was sacrificial for us, right? I just want to let you know this too. Anything that I say today, anything that I talk about when it comes to financial gifts or, or, or tithing, if you want to call it that, or, or an offering, anything that I say, I hold myself to the very same standard that I'm sharing. Uh, Pastor Rick holds himself 
to the very same standards that I'm sharing. We hold each other accountable on that. We were just talking about that this week, how he could be praying for me when it comes to being sacrificial in my giving. There's all sorts of things. We hold ourselves to the same standards. So anything that I say today, I it hurts me as much as it hurts you. You know what I mean? And so there's a, a, a few things that, I, that I've that i kind of mulled on as we've gone through this. One of the things that's really important, the reason that we uh, value giving in the church is not because we want a rich church. It's not because I want a, a higher salary. It's because it's a spiritual discipline. It's a spiritual discipline. Spiritual disciplines are things that we do. They're disciplines, things that help us in our walk with Jesus, help us grow in our relationship with him, strengthen us to be closer to God. Just like um, uh, healthy disciplines, like uh, working out is a healthy discipline, helps you get stronger, right? Uh, eating better, going to sleep at you know, regular times, like those are disciplines that help you stay healthy in the same way spiritual disciplines help you to stay healthy with Jesus in your relationship with him. And we believe that giving is a spiritual discipline. But why? Why? Why is giving a spiritual discipline? It's because when we relinquish the things that are valuable to us, it teaches us dependence on God. It teaches us to trust him with the things that we want to hold on to. It teaches us to believe that he's going to use those for his glory. It teaches us faith. It's a faith booster. So today, as we learn what God says about giving, we're going to be looking at a few different passages uh, that Jesus shares with us, and we're going to glean from those passages, okay? Um, but before we even touch on those three stories, my first point to you is that everything that you bring was already borrowed. Everything that you bring was already borrowed. What I mean by that is God's the creator. He owns it all. Everything is his. And you're just borrowing it. John 1, it says this, John 1, 1 through 5, In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave, gave life to everything that was created. And this life, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God is the creator, right? Not only is he the creator of all these things, like this table, or these <coughs> stones, or this building, or or even your finances, he's not just the creator of those things. He's the creator of your very soul, your very life. The breath that you breathe is created by God. He owns it all. Yet, yet, when I think about giving personally, this is an honest moment, I, I want to do it begrudgingly. I'm like, okay, here you go take out my wallet and throw a 20 in or you know what I mean like I don't have a great attitude about it and why is that why do I not have a great attitude about it? it's because I'm not acknowledging the very fact that God provided everything if I were to give you a million dollars each of you I say hey you, know, you get a million and you get a million you get a million if I were to give you a million dollars today how would that make you feel Pretty good, right? I would, I'll take a million. Hey, by the way, just advertising, if anyone wants to give me a million dollars, I'll take it. Um, that's not the sermon. That's not the, the word of God. I'm just saying, that's a caveat. Um, I would feel pretty good if someone came up to me and gave me a million dollars. Now, now, let's up it a little bit. Say, uh, how about 10 million? You want 10? Okay, sure, fine, great, awesome. Um, and then I'll say, okay, but... Uh, I'll give you the 10 million, but you won't wake up tomorrow. Would you still take it? It's kind of a mixed bag because some people are smarter. They want to invest it, give it to their families, but not. 
But if it was just you, if it was just you, and you were the only one that could benefit from this, from this money, would you say, yeah, I'll, I'll take it? No. The reason is, is because we acknowledge that life, a life to be lived, is more valuable than $10 million, right? But who gives that life? Yes. He gives us life. Who provides us with an earth that revolves? Who, who provides us with a nature that produces? Yeah, hey, you guys got to talk a little bit louder. Who provides us with a nature that produces? Yes, amen. Who provides us with a, a, a family? Who provides us with jobs? Jesus is our provider. And when we acknowledge that he is everything to us, it's, it's less of me giving away and more so giving back. It's about giving back to him. Without him, you have absolutely nothing. It's all his. And he gave it to us to steward, right? Steward means to be responsible for, to handle well. He gave us everything we have to steward. Today, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, he gave it to us to be responsible and to give him glory. You get what I'm saying? Everything that you bring was already borrowed. All right? And then our first story from Jesus is found in Mark 12. You can turn there. Mark 12. Jesus um, is talking with uh, a bunch of Pharisees, and he's, they've been kind of questioning him, testing him, pushing him a little bit to you know, try to trap him in some of their questions. Uh, not only does Jesus dodge every question, not necessarily dodge, but answer questions fully, not only does he do that, but he also kind of turns it back on them and says, well, what about you? And uh, they don't like that so much. They're, they're getting uh, a little defensive. They actually, it says earlier in this passage that they want to kill him, uh, but they can't because he's right. And, um, and so after all of this discussion, he goes and sits down. And this is what it says in verse 41. Mark 12, 41 says this. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people dropped in, put in large amounts. <coughs> and then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor woman has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. When you think about giving back financially to God, number one, Everything you bring was already borrowed. Number two, it's quality over quantity. It's quality over quantity. Jesus sits down next to this offering plate, right? And he sees people coming in, and they're kind of strutting in, you know, their shoulders back saying, hey, look at all this. And they're clinking, they're, I, I imagine them having just like bags of money. Um, they're just like shaking it around in their bag and dropping it in really hard to make a big noise, you know, clinging, clanging of the coins. And they're, they're thinking, you know, oh man, you know, look at me. <laughs> I got this. I, I'm making pretty big contributions here. You know, I got the big bucks. I'm making a difference. If I left this temple, you know, this temple would be hurting for money. But you know, since I'm here, and they're, they're feeling this hubris about their amounts, about their quantities, right? And then this poor little woman comes up and is thinking, <laughs> what? are two coins going to be? It's just two coins. I don't know what God can do with this. I, I'm not like those other ones who, who have large amounts of money. I'm not like those. I don't have that. I, I can barely survive on my own. And this is what I got left. But I'm going to trust God. 
I'm going to be faithful to him. She drops him the two coins. Jesus notices her. He notices her. And it's not because of the quantity, right? It's because of the quality of her sacrifice. I think that's beautiful. Jesus acknowledges that not everyone is at the same financial status. We're not, not looking for numbers from you guys. What we're looking for is the spiritual discipline, the heart behind it. And I think it's really important. It's really important for us to grasp. Jesus valued not the money, but the heart. And Jesus prefers a quiet giver as well, by the way. A quiet giver. Someone who's going to help generously out of love, asking for nothing in return. There's a lot of times where I'm tempted, probably you are tempted, to kind of do things a little bit more, hey, look at me, I did this, I did that. I want to show you that I'm a great person, or that I I give a lot of money, or I'm helping this person out, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that. But there's glory revol- or like involved in that, isn't there? There's like this part of you that is saying, yeah, I need some credit for all the things that I've been doing. Jesus desires, loves a quiet giver. Someone who's going to serve purely out of their intentions for that person and for the Lord. And I think that's important for us to acknowledge when we're talking about financial giving. Uh, Jesus also says this in another pass in another passage. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing when it comes to giving. Meaning, don't don't be tallying for your sake just to puff yourself up. That's different for like taxes or or different things like that. What I'm saying is specifically to to tally up all my good deeds. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. I think it's really important to be humble in your sacrifice. That's what Jesus desires. There's this uh, illustration that a lot of pastors use. I'll just use it here because, uh, you know, why not? Um, and uh, there's this guy. He's a, he's a CEO of a company. Or no, excuse me. He's not a CEO of a company. He, he's climbing the corporate ladder, right? So he's got this pretty good job. He's making $100,000 a year. Um, he goes to church and he says, you know what? I'm going to tithe on that money. I'm going to give my 10%. Um, and so he does. He gives his $10,000 a year to the church. Um, he's feeling good. A couple of years later, he gets a promotion. He's now a director. He's in a director position. He's making like $200,000 a year. Pretty amazing stuff. He's like, I'm still going to tithe on it. And he, and he tithes. He gives us 10%. He gets $20,000 a year. That is, praise the Lord. It's awesome. He's, he's trying to be obedient to what he believes is, is right for his situation. And then he, he moves up. He becomes a vice president. He, he's at like I don't know, I'm going to choose a crazy number, $500,000 a year, all right? He's got, he's got to give $50,000 a year in order to keep his proportions the same. And he's like, oh my goodness, I don't, that's a lot of money to give up. I don't know if I can do it. Uh, but he does it. He's faithful. He, he, he chooses to do it. The CEO, something happens and he steps down, the vice president gets booted up to the CEO office. He gets another pay raise. He's making a million dollars a year. It's insane. And he said, oh my goodness, I cannot give $100,000 away. I can't do it. It's hard. It's really hard. It's a lot of money. But he's like, but I also want to be obedient. I don't know what to do. I'm going to go talk to my pastor. He goes and talks to his pastor. He says, listen, he explains the whole situation. The pastor says, you know, I understand. You you." God's blessed you with a lot. You want to be faithful with the gifts that you've been given? He's like, yes. He said, but it's a lot of money. It's a big chunk. He's like, yeah, that's that's what's really hard for me. He said, you know what? I totally understand. No hard feelings. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God would demote you so that you would be able to (laughs) be obedient. That's pretty, uh, that's absolutely not what the guy wanted, Right? He wanted him to kind of let him off the hook. But the thing is, the pastor didn't care about the quantity. He could, the pastor could have pressured him, said, no, you've got to give your 10. Right? The pastor didn't care about that. What he cared about was the heart of the man, the obedience in his heart. 
The guy was focused on the money. The pastor was focused on the master. I think it's super important. Our hearts are prone to hold on, right? To count out, to tally our good deeds. But what Jesus wants doesn't start with hands. It starts with hearts. And at this church, we're not asking you to give your 10%. That's not our request for you. What we are asking for is a sacrificial amount between you and God. Leave me, leave Pastor Rick, leave our elders, leave our financial advisory out of it. This is between you and God. What we desire for you is spiritual growth. And we believe this is part of your spiritual growth. This is not, I don't, I don't have anything to do with this. This is completely between you and God. And so, I guess what I want to say is, hearing all of this, hearing about quality over quantity, talk with uh, your family members, talk with your spouse, talk with the Lord, pray about asking, ask God, hey, where am I at with you in my quality of my sacrifice? Where am I at? Am I doing this with the right heart? Am I doing this with the right intentions? Ask him. Be obedient to him. He wants quality over quantity. So everything you bring was already borrowed. It's quality over quantity. Number three, choose the master, not the money. Choose the master, not the money. Turn with me in Matthew 6. It's the book right before Mark. Matthew 6, Jesus is giving his most famous sermon. It's the Sermon on the Mount. He, he goes through all sorts of different social situations and he says, hey, you know what? Uh, instead of, you heard it said, do this. I'm going to flip that on its head, do this instead. You've heard it say, do this. I'm going to tell you to do this instead. He's talking, talking about forgiving 70 times 7, right? He's talking about uh, if you've even looked at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery. He, he's, he's, he's giving more. And then he shares this in Matthew 6, 24 through 33. No one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than they are? Well, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't make or work, they don't work or make their clothing, and yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully, so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live generous or live righteously, and He will give you everything, everything you need. Praise the Lord. Our God is a provider, amen. amen. Let's just sit in that. How many of you had a, a house to sleep in last night? Some of you, one of you actually tore down your house. So I don't know. Uh, they did have a house to sleep in. How many of you had, had a, a dinner on that plate last night? When, when was the last time you had to really worry about your immediate needs? Like a place to stay and food to eat. I mean, it is amazing. God is our provider. He cares for the birds. He cares for the flowers. He cares for you. And he cares for you way more than he cares for those things. And there are two people in this story. There's the, there's the lover of money. It's like the people that are the birds. 
uh, or that aren't acting like the birds, that should be acting like the birds. It's the people that are worried about you know, storing up their stuff and making sure that it's all gonna work out. These planners and, and, they're, and they're accumulating this wealth so that they can let it go uh, in a controlled rate. And then there's the lovers of the things that money can buy. So there's the lovers of money and there's the lovers of things money can buy. Those are like the, the people that are uh, trying to dress like the lilies of the field, right? They're trying to wear the nicest clothes, trying to be uh, everything. Um, there's those two people, but the, the problem is they're both focused on accumulating. They're not focused on God, they're not focused on others, they're focused on accumulating their wealth. That's been a serious message that God's been teaching me. Being an adult, living with a career and a job, you know, and a family and all these things. It's been something that's constantly, consistently being taught to me over and over again that it's not up to me. That my life doesn't just belong to me. My life is in the Father's hands. It is so hard. My, my heart, I, there, are, there are months where I'm tempted to say, you know, things are a little tight this month. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to wait. I'm going to, I'll hold off till next month. And there, then next month comes and it's like, oh, I don't know. Things are a little tight again. And, and it will snowball. Uh, I've been tempted to do that many months. God pushes me to say, no, don't do that. The problem is I'm serving two masters. I'm serving money, and I'm serving God. But they can't both be on the same level. One's got to come before the other. One's got to give. You can't serve two masters. Not equally. You're, 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 you're constantly trying to do this dance, this balance between the two, and eventually you get exhausted, and you drop the ball on one. you got to choose the money or the master. That's what Jesus is talking about here. But God is asking you. God is asking me to give up the money to serve the true master. You can't serve both. And also, we, I will say this too, you know, it, it says that God provides. And that's true. But you can't live your life paycheck to paycheck giving God money and then expecting a miracle to drop out of the sky every single month. Like you can't do that. That's not a, a realistic way of living. Uh, you know, sometimes that is the case though. God does uh, sometimes there have been times where ends were not meeting and I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to, how to reconcile this because I'm struggling right now. God, what do I do? Something happens, you know, I get my tax return back that month. Or, you know, something happens where, uh, you know, I get uh, God's provided. But that's not every month, and we shouldn't expect that either. The reality is God is asking us not to fit him into our budget. He's asking our budget to fit around him. We need to prepare. This is, it, you know, sometimes giving financially means... I'm not going to buy that extra cup of coffee this week or this month. You know what I mean? It, it, maybe it's uh, those, that pair of shoes. I'm not going to buy that. There, there's always something that is pulling at us, pulling us away from God. He's saying, hey, revolve your life around me. Your budget revolves around me. I don't take a back seat. That's what he's saying. Choose the master, not the money. Choose the master, not the money. Lastly, we're going to be looking at a verse in 2 Corinthians. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. It'll be on the screens. It says this. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Hmm. God loves a person who gives cheerfully. When I first uh, started giving as an adult, I did not do that cheerfully. <laughs> I would classify myself as a miser, someone who's a Scrooge, you know, who's trying to 
pinch the penny until it cries. I could give you all sorts of, you know, different analogies. Um, you know, I I have that love of money tugging on my heart regularly, and it's and it pulls me down. And so giving is tough for me. You know, I can make every excuse under the book for why I shouldn't be giving. Um, but none of those are really that valid. Um, it's hard. It's sacrificial. Giving. Can, can we still be cheerful while things are hard and sacrificial? When things are tough, can we still be cheerful? It's kind of a hard lesson. Well, let's look at Christ's example, right? You know, Christ lived on this earth. He lived a perfect life. Completely perfect. He lived alongside imperfect people that failed him regularly. That was just his life. He never uh, lost the standard while everyone else completely lost the standard. Right? He showed love and he served and he gave and he shared the truth. But it, and he was honest and compassionate, empathetic. He was everything that we would ever need. And what did we do? <laughs> we completely despised him. He was outcast by the popular people, the, the Pharisees, the cool kids, right? The priests and the scribes. They all hated him. And in fact, we killed him because we didn't want the truth. We didn't believe everything that he said. Now, could, have, could Christ have had joy in any of that? John 15. John 15 says this, 9 through 11. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's also talking to you and me when he says this. He says, I have loved you even as my Father has loved me. Remain in my love. Another word for remain is abide. Remain in my love. Abide in my love. When you obey my commands, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. My joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Jesus' joy came from doing what the Father asked of him. He says our joy comes from continually walking with him, remaining in him, abiding in him, and in step with the Father. Why did Jesus love doing what the Father told him to do, though? Why, why was that something that brought him joy? Because Jesus knew... That all obedience is deserved from God, right? God is so good. He's so amazing. He, he's infinitely loving. And so all obedience belongs to him. Jesus trusted the Father. Jesus acknowledged that the Father's in control. Jesus knew what the payment of sin would, be, would mean for all of creation. He knew everything. And when he saw the big picture, when he saw everything that God is, he had joy, and he joyfully followed because he acknowledged everything about who Jesus says he is. And that is the encouragement for you. Number four, cheerful giving is recognizing the gospel. Cheerful giving is recognizing the gospel. I'll have the worship team come up at this time. You know, and it's so true in so many ways, right? When we see how much we've been forgiven, we tend to forgive more, right? When we see how much grace we've received, we tend to give more grace. When we see how wise God is, we look to Him for guidance. When we see how powerful He is, we tend to humble ourselves before Him. And in the same way, when we recognize the gospel, all the love that Christ poured out, all the sacrifice that he made, all the torment that he endured, and the fact that he was separated from the Father because of your sins and my sins, the, greatest, the worst thing that could have happened to Jesus happened to him. For you, out of love for you, and when you recognize, acknowledge the sacrifice that he's made, First of all, it should fill us with joy. And second of all, it should make us desire to be sacrificial for Christ. Amen. Number one, everything you bring was already borrowed. Number two, it's quality over quantity. 
Number three, choose the master, not the money. And number four, cheerful giving is recognizing the gospel. Let that sink into your heart. Ask God today, where's my heart at when it comes to faithfully giving? Where, where's my heart at when it comes to sacrificing for you? Where's my heart at? Am I in line with you, Jesus? Don't ask. You can ask me, but I'm, but I'm not telling you that I'm in charge of your finances. I'm not telling you that Rick's in charge of your finances. God's in charge of it. Take it up with him. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are the ultimate giver, and we can never, ever outgive you. Oh, Lord, thank you that you uh, not only sacrificed your life, but you've given us everything. You've given us a story. You are writing a story of our lives, and you're a part of it. You're showing us who you are. You're making us more like you. God, thank you that you chose that to be a part of our journey. Lord, would you help us to become cheerful givers? Would you help us to be people that recognize that everything that we have is borrowed from you? Would you help us to acknowledge uh, that our gifts are required to be sacrificial, not just a number, not just a big number. It's not surplus that it's surrender. God, would you help us to be cheerful givers, acknowledging the gospel? Jesus, thank you for the ways that you are shaping us, refining us, sanctifying us. We love you and we commit ourselves to you. We pray this in the mighty name, the giver of life, Jesus. Amen.